Greetings and welcome. We are in uh, the Northwest College 1010 course, and this is meeting number three, and we're now just talking briefly about the next writing assignment. So we're on page 103 of the uh, Axelrod Cooper text, and uh, let's make a couple of quick observations about the next assignment of next Thursday evening, meeting uh, number uh, four for March 30th. Uh, the assignment is another reflective essay. So let's start there with that term. I want you to grow comfortable with that term, a reflective essay, where, just like we talked about in the last essay, the one you're handing in this evening, you are going to reflect or think back up on X. Okay. In chapter two, it was an event, a single event. Right. In this one, notice, read with me, you're going to write an essay about a person. They use the adjective intriguing, person an intriguing place or an intriguing activity in your community. Okay? You're going to observe the subject closely and then you're going to present what you've learned in a way that both informs and engages readers. Now, let me make this really easy for you because I kind of like, like I said to you last session, when you got an entire week to write one of these things, that's a whole different than when you're working with the turnaround of a Wednesday. Would you agree with me? So I try and help you to maybe streamline this project a little bit. So let's talk about it. To make it real easy, choose a single individual, underline the word single. So you're not talking about group or something like that. Choose a single individual who has had a powerful influence in your life for some reason or another. This can be positive or negative. And then in your essay, simply discuss three reasons why this individual has been important in your life. Okay? And that will make this essay a fairly simple essay for you to write. Okay? Some of you will say, I've uh, kind of already written an essay like this before in my academic career. Now, at some point, I suppose we've got to address this issue of the P word, plagiarism, okay? Now, when we start talking about plagiarism, especially in the academic community, as I defined the academic community in our last lecture, this surprises a lot of students who are just coming out of the high school experience because for them, plagiarism, while it's you know, considered kind of not the thing to do, it was not seen as the heinous crime, and I do mean it that way, that it's often seen within the academic community, okay? Now, one of the reasons for that goes back to this lecture that I gave when I was talking about those different kinds of degrees, and I talked about when you get a master's degree or a PhD, you've got to write what's called a thesis or a dissertation, a body, a book of research, right? That research must be of your own creation, and it cannot be of somebody else's creation. To reference someone else or to use someone else's work without proper attribution is constituted as plagiarism. Well, I have more to say about this as we get into the semester. However, believe it or not, to hand in a paper in class A that you wrote in class B is considered plagiarism. No kidding. Now, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I didn't say to hand in a paper that you did not write in class A, but you're handing it in in class B as if you wrote it. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying a paper that you actually created and wrote in an anthropology class, and then you turn around in a political science class and hand in the same paper. Believe it or not, in the academic community, that is constituted as plagiarism. No kidding. Now, for those of you that are kind of giving me that incredulous look like, you've got to be kidding me. Dude, I wrote this paper. Why shouldn't I save time and energy and hand it in a second time? Uh, the answer is, well, the, the simple reason is because it's constituted as plagiarism. Now. Having said that, in our 1010 experience, I'm more interested in you knowing these rules so you understand if you're going to violate these rules or play around the fringe, you know what you're doing. Uh, I will tell you that in my class, as long as you've written a paper, I'm willing to accept it, especially because this is a 1010 class where, hello, we're trying to work on writing papers, right? I mean, you got me? So, I mean, if you, if you hand in a paper that you wrote in another class, I actually am okay with that, but I want you to be aware that there are profs who will constitute that as plagiarism and they will fail you for the semester. Of course, plagiarism has gotten so 
such a big deal that actually students are now being thrown out of school for plagiarism. Um, there's now some new software that all of you are going to see here pretty quickly. We won't see it in this class because it's still in the process of being accepted at Northwest College and elsewhere, called turnitin.com. I would write that down, by the way, and I would go home and take a look at it. Turnitin.com is a software where all profs are now going to uh, um, require that any paper that you submit has first of all been submitted to this turnitin.com site. Now, what is this site? Well, if you use it just on your own, it costs about $10 a paper, uh, but when there is an account through a college or university, it doesn't cost you anything. It's part of like the cost to go to the school or whatever. But basically, any paper that you write goes through this turnitin.com site where that software will scan all over the internet to find any moments in your paper when there are any similarities of any kind. And those come up as what are called hot. That is to say, they're red flagged. Now, of course, if there are word-for-word -word similarities, that is okay and not constituted as plagiarism if and only if what? You give proper attribution, right? That is to say, there's quotation marks around it and a style book, either an MLA or an APA style book, that says where that information came from. On the other hand, if you don't have that kind of attribution and it's word for word, that constitutes plagiarism. Of course, we know that there's another form of citation. We'll talk much about this later, won't we? Where you can summarize or paraphrase information, right? And then it's not word for word, but you still have to say where the information came from, right? Apparently, and I haven't worked with turnitin.com yet as software, but apparently it does a pretty thorough job of finding papers that have been written anywhere on the net and posted, we grade saver dot com sites and all of that. Uh, it, it, it has all its stores, it has access to all of those sites. So now all of a sudden this limits students' capacity to be able to use technology to write a faster paper by quick cut and paste and the like, gummy. Uh, for our purposes right now, the one observation that I want to make is that if you've written a paper already that has something similar to this assignment, and I think most of you have, then I would go back and begin the process of asking two things. One, is it worthy of a submission in a 1010 course? That is to say, is it, you know, has it been vetted well, you know, have I proofed, et cetera? And then secondly, do you answer that second part of the question that's actually not there in detail on page 103? Three reasons why this individual is influential, has been influential in your life, okay? And what I would say about this, although I won't get into a lot of form tonight in terms of essay writing, what I would say is let's concentrate on at least three paragraphs for the three reasons why the individual is important to you. Does that make sense, what I just said? So at least give three different paragraphs that talk about three different attributes of that individual. And as long as you've done that, now it goes without saying because I know all of you are, are, stu are studying or have studied with instructors that have already kind of taught you the fundamental rules of a five paragraph essay where you have some kind of an introduction and some kind of a conclusion. So let's go ahead and just stipulate right now that we're at least looking for a five paragraph essay that we would constitute as typed. We would ask that you do not use any kind of font size larger than 10 or 11, just to say paper, right? Just to say paper. Uh, and uh, in terms of form, double space. Okay, but all of this you probably have already been taught before in terms of the fundamental form of a paper, all right? Do you have any questions for me about the assignment of, uh, of packet four? Again, one more time, chapter three notes, the grammar handbook E, the teaching company lectures four and five we will actually do on Thursday, and then the chapter three paper Again, uh, the assignment writing profiles is the term you will use on a cover page. So you'll call it the chapter four uh, um, assignment, I'm sorry, chapter three assignment writing profiles, okay? Description of uh, people and places, okay? So uh, I will ask the question kind of for you. All right, uh, you know, exactly what is going on with this annotation? You use the term. Uh, when, you, uh, when we're reading chapter three, 
we're not only now just taking bullet point notes, but we're also doing this thing called annotation. So what's going on with that, and can you help me understand what the expectations are there? You bet. The easiest way to do that is to have out some paper for notes. At the top of those, uh, at the top of those pages of notes, go ahead and put uh, the phrase annotation. And then open your hymnal to page 76. And that's actually where we're going to start, all right? Good evening, Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, I, I went ahead and started and, uh, and ran videotape, so any of the intel that you missed from the floor, I can be sure and post, okay? And since I'm recording, I'll just go ahead and keep recording. That will allow you, for those of you who maybe want to go back and study some of this information again, feel free to always do that at Learn Strong, okay? <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to give now a real brief lecture, an introductory lecture to, uh, to annotation, and then for the rest of the evening, we're going to spend our time you know, talking specifically compositional theory with uh, lectures one, two, and three. Let's begin with this term, uh, annotation, okay? Now, I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna use a different term, not just the word annotation, I'm gonna use the term active reading, okay? As opposed to what? Well, we might call it passive reading, or we might call it survival reading. Students often will say to me, I hate to read, and I will say, no, you don't. No, dude, I do. And I'm like, really? Can you imagine what it would be like if you could not read driving downtown Denver? You couldn't read. I mean, anything. Some of us that have traveled overseas, we know this terrible feeling when we get off the bus at the bus station, and there ain't no English, and that's the only language you speak, and you're looking at another language trying to figure out what it says. Imagine what it would be like to go to the grocery store you couldn't read. Think about this. The only thing you could rely on was either seeing pictures on the product itself to tell you what you're looking at, correct? Or to be able to see through something that's containing the, the product, right? And then try to figure it out. Beyond that, you wouldn't have a clue what it is that you were buying, right? If you couldn't read. But that's kind of like survival reading or what we do when we pick up a Sports Illustrated or what we do when we're Google searching or we're messing around on the net when we're reading our Cosmopolitan or whatever, okay? So that is survival reading. What we're doing when we're reading in the academic community is something fundamentally different, and I want to outline it now. And then I want to make an argument as to why it matters. Several of you said in the paper that you wrote about what you hope to gain from a 1010 class is improvement in reading, and that's a good thing to say. But what does it mean to improve in our reading? Okay? That's what we want to answer now. What is this academic reading? Well. The first thing we want to say about it is, is reading, understanding that there will be a response, and this response is of two kinds. It can either be an oral response or a written response. I've got to say both because that's a big dog deal. Increasingly, and part of it is because this plagiarism thing I was just talking about, increasingly my colleagues at the university and the college level are now going increasingly to an oral response. So for example, think about how brilliant this is. If I'm teaching from chapter 7 in history, causes of the American Civil War, and I want to really know if you read it or not, as opposed to somebody gave you the notes and then you copied them down and you pretended like you read it, it's pretty easy for me to just say, I'm going to hear from each one of you for five minutes on a question that I will ask you from chapter 7. As soon as I finish asking the question, I will begin my timepiece, and at the end of five minutes, you will stop talking. And the score that you will get then will constitute your semester average for a midterm. Ready? Ms. Strout, you will begin with the question, discuss the primary causes as outlined, especially by Hamilton in Chapter 7 in regards to the three causes of the American Civil War. And then the prof just sits down and literally just starts flowing. The same thing you do when you're watching a lecture, the prof does the same thing when you start talking. Every ah, uh, every ah, uh, every ah, uh, all of that gets you know, negative points. And the prof's argument is real simple. You can't plagiarize that, huh? -huh. You either know it or you don't. Now, for those of us that say, uh, dude, I can know a whole lot, but you put me on the spot like that, and I got, I'm gonna begin by doing 14, uh, okay, okay, okay. I mean, that's just, I'm not real good in front of people talking, and so I don't think that's a real fair representation of whether I read chapter seven of my history book or not. You get my drift? But a lot of profs, I'm telling you, a lot of profs expect that, 
kind of an oral response. Of course, the second is some kind of written response, whether it comes in the form of exams or papers or whatever. Okay? So because that's the case, we're going to define this active reading as almost like discovery reading. Some have, some have actually explained this as almost like going on a treasure hunt. I like, however, this term, a dialogue with the writer. Okay? Underline or circle that word dialogue, a back and forth. For example, if I'm having a conversation with Mr. Garza, we're talking, he does certain things, communication theory, right? He does certain things to let me know that he's listening. He leans in. He nods. He makes eye contact. If I say something, like for example, we're talking about, I don't know, students that were all in high school. And I say, you know, it just seems to me that ignorance is ubiquitous at Worland High School. Now, if I'm having a conversation with Mr. Garza, he's going to say, if he doesn't know the word ubiquitous, he's going to say, whoa, 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 what did you just say about students? What is that, ubiqu what? And I will say, you know, ubiquitous. No, I don't know. What does that mean? You know, ubiquitous, like everywhere present. In other words, stupidity is rampant at Worland High School. That's what I mean. Oh, okay, I didn't know that word, ubiquitous. I'm going to have to look that one up. I'll try to remember that one. See, that's what we do when we have a conversation, right? We do the exact same thing when we're reading actively. Now think about this. If you're reading a Stephen King novel and you get to the end of the first chapter, you don't ask yourself, gee, what was the name of that guy that was working at a gas station? I've got, I got to go back. I've got to remember the name of that guy. No, because you're just reading for pleasure, for fun, right? So that is to say, you're not going to be tested. There's not going to be some kind of special response. Nobody's going to be asking you multiple choice questions over chapter one of a Stephen King novel, right? But if a Stephen King novel is assigned in a lit course, at the end of the first chapter, there's a few things you might want to make sure that you know. If you've read correctly, you'll be able to know that information. How do we derive this information? Well, we're going to take notes while we, write, while we read. These notes we will call annotation. Okay? That's, all, that's all that fancy word means. To read and to take notes. Now, there's two kinds of annotation. There's what we call internal annotation, and there's what we call external annotation. Okay. What I'm talking about, by the way, is really important, but very, very few of your profs are ever going to talk about it with you. That's why you're in a 1010 class. So, for example, you're taking the, uh, you know, the history class at the university, and uh, you, chapter 7 is assigned. Uh, no history prof normally is going to stand in front of you and say, now, dude, when I assign chapter 7 for you to read, this is what I expect you to do. This is how I expect you to read it. The expectation or the understanding, the assumption, is that you already know how to do this kind of academic reading. Got me? Internal annotation. Notes that we take in the book, in the text. Okay? I used to do this thing. Well, you're looking right there at page 76, 77. Forget about all the colored stuff on the inside. Did you notice the margins? Do you see that? Uh, I, I just did this randomly. Open to page 141. I, I, I just did this randomly to prove my point. Page 141. Do you notice something interesting about page 141 in regards to the amount of white space there is on the right? Do you see that on page 141? Do you see all that white space that's there? Now, why would they need all of that white space on page 141? That's white space. There ain't no words there. Seems to me they could have shrunk this book down by cutting all those margins off, made the book cheaper because they could make it smaller. Why are the margins there? Because there's an assumption that when you are reading these books, you are annotating these books. That's a little bit different from high school, isn't it? Why? Because you spent all your life in school being told, don't write your books. Now all of a sudden I'm telling you, you're going to have to learn to write your books. Recommendation. I recommend you do it with red ink. Make sense? Because the red ink allows you to, your ink to stand out from the, the white on black or black on white, whichever way you like to think about what it is you're looking at in your, you know, in your book itself. Okay? Internal annotations, notes done with a red ink pen in the paper itself, in the text itself. Now look, any monkey with a highlighter can make monk, marks in the book. You hearing me? So, I mean, just because you're marking up the book doesn't necessarily mean that you're taking good notes. So, suggestion. I recommend in the internal annotation that you do, 
to be very limited and very specific. Know exactly what it is that you're doing so that you're not just marking up the entire book. Because in the end, why are you doing this kind of mark, marking up and note-taking? You're trying to get ready to respond. Well, I mean, dude, if you like underline every line in chapter 7 of the history book, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's not, it's not really helping you. The second kind of response is external. This is what we call, this is off the page, off the text page, okay? This is why you got notebook paper, all right? This external annotation is what I'm going to be spending now my next few minutes talking about, all right? How do you derive information from a text, okay? The way you do that will vary depending upon the kind of textbook, okay? But college textbooks are constructed in very similar ways. Now, you didn't have to buy this book because I gave it to you, didn't I? But if you had to buy this book, it would cost you somewhere in the range of about 150 bucks. Okay? Textbooks are extremely expensive. You've got to buy your books when you go to the university. One of the first things you'll do is have to go into the bookstore. Usually it's in the union. You'll go down into a special part of the student bookstore where all the stacks of the books and then there will be little cards there, it'll say the prof's name, it'll say the book that's required for that class, along with the class name. Now here's the thing, I'll use 1010 as a classic example. A book like Axelrod Cooper, there's at least a thousand of these books that are published every year about how to improve your writing. Right? In math, you'll have to buy a textbook. In biology, you'll have to buy a textbook. In biology, every year, there's a whole bunch of these books that get published. So the obvious question is, why is the Professor McMillan, who you're taking biology from, why is it that she would require this textbook? Well, the answer is simple. One, maybe she wrote the book. That sometimes happens. And she gets a kickback on royalties, so she makes her students buy the book. Two, and probably more to the case, she has looked at 15 or 20 other potential biology textbooks. She chose this one because it accomplishes her goal of instructing you. Okay? With that in mind, Let's talk about how these textbooks are created. Most textbooks are created okay, with a certain kind of format that's fairly predictable. We went through this last week, notice, with just this textbook, right? There's going to usually be some kind of intro with some kind of objectives of some kind or another, right? In this chapter on the American Civil War, Chapter 7, you will learn the following. Bam, 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 bam. Okay, these objectives are usually listed. It's crucial. You always want to pay attention to that stuff. Two, there will be some kind of treatment, right? Or we could say problems um, uh, with solutions, right? Okay, if we're talking math. The sample problem is the easiest way maybe for you to say that, right? There's going to be some kind of treatment or introductory materials. Depending on the discipline, that will be understood and presented in different ways. History, you're going to see a lot of bullet pointing of dates, aren't you? People's names, junk like that. Biology, you're going to see a lot of bullet pointing of vocabulary, right? All that kind of stuff. Mathematics, usually going to be several sample problems where the problem is solved and explained, right? Finally, three, there's usually going to be some kind of review. This can come in the form of questions. It can come in the form of problems in a math textbook. It could be, you know, problems that have to be solved or whatever. Now, if you'll think about it, all the textbooks that you looked at coming through high school, very similarly set up. If you'll think about it, this textbook is kind of set up similarly, right? Think about it. First of all, there's an introduction. So, for example, if you back... Uh, turn back just a few pages to uh, chapter 3's beginning. I'm with you on page 7273. They're going to tell you, right, th this is a chapter on writing profiles, and they're going to tell you a little bit about what that's like. They're going to give you some basic information, aren't they, right? Then, notice, number two, there's going to be some kind of treatment, okay? So now, in our textbook, this is what we would call the models, all right? Then finally, we already looked at that page, didn't we? They're going to have you write an assignment to show that you understood the very thing that they said you needed to learn for that chapter. Okay? 
Now, I'll pause here and make a point that's got nothing to do with language arts or literature or composition. When you take a math class, the assumption by the math instructor is that you will be the one teaching yourself mathematics. No kidding. I have a pal. He walks in on the first night. He hands out the uh, course outline, just like the one I gave to you. He makes sure everybody has the book. He says, when I see you in the next session, these are the problems, that the problem sets you need to have, uh, have solved. Bring your questions with you. See you. They'll leave. Next session, he walks in front of them and he says, problem sets I already assigned. Any questions? Most of these are freshman students, and so they just kind of look at him like, uh, dude, you're, you are going to like work the problem on the board for us, right? And he says, all right, well, if there are no questions, here's the next set of sample problems, uh, uh, problem sets. I'll see you next time. And he leaves. He literally walks out of the, out of the lecture hall. And the, and the poor freshmen are just like sitting there like, whoa, 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 what, what the hell just happened? Like, when is he going to actually teach us the class, you know, the, the problems? And uh, usually there's a TA that comes up and says, all right, welcome to university. There's a reason you bought that book. Get to work teaching yourself mathematics. Your teacher is a facilitator of instruction. If you got a question, you bring it with you. Why would your teacher teach you what you can learn from the book? That's a waste of his energies. And remember what we said last week. Why is that teacher really there in mathematics? It ain't to teach you mathematics. That teacher is there to do research, correct? That's why that teacher is there. Spending time in front of a classroom teaching you how to do mathematics that a textbook can teach to you, that's a waste of his or her time. Do you got me? So I want to pause here by saying our conversation about reading in four years when or five, when you finish your experience in the academic community, no single lecture will have been more important because 90% of what you will do in the academic community is read. I'll give a classic example of this. A, st a student of mine is rooming with her roommate who they're both nursing majors. And uh, it's midterms and grades come out. My student has an A, her roommate has a C minus. It's bad. You don't want a C minus when you're a nursing mate. And she says, I don't understand to my student. I don't understand what's going on. I am in the same class as you in biology. I'm reading from the exact same textbook. Dude, we stay up all night and we read this stupid textbook together. I'm reading, you're reading. I take the tests. I got a C minus, you got an A. What's going on? And the student, my student says, well, I, you know, I don't know, but I think I might have an idea. Um, where's your book? She's like, what do you mean, where's my book? What, is, what difference does that make? It's the same book you have. She said, I know, I know, but I need to know if you're reading. She said, what are you talking about? You see me sitting every night in the dorm room with you reading the stupid book. And she's like, no, no, I, I need to know if you're reading. Can you just hand me your book? So she hands the book to my student. My student opens to the first chapter, and she closes the book, hands it back, and says, well, you're not reading the book. She's like, now I'm, now I'm about to get really pissed because you know I'm reading the book. I've been doing it in front of you. And my student says this, no, no, you're reading. You're just not reading. And now, now our roommate's like ready to hit her over the head with a bat. What do you mean I'm reading but I'm not reading? She says, you're reading the book, but you're reading the biology book the way you would read a novel. You're just kind of sitting down just reading it. She's like, yeah. She said, well, you've got to annotate the chapters to get ready for the exam. Annotate? What does that mean? Well, you've got to read and take notes. You can't just read the biology book. We're going four weeks before an exam. Besides that, the prof's not covering everything that's in the book. And the exams that are being given by the prof in biology, guess what? Made by the textbook company. So if you don't know the book... You ain't going to do very well on the tests. Does that make sense? She asked, well, how do, you, how do you annotate? Good question. I'm glad you asked it. Let's talk about it. Annotation. External annotation, obviously internal annotation will follow external annotation. But external annotation will assume a blank sheet of paper. Now, you can do this by typing, but I, have, I, I really do recommend that this is something you do manually. All right? So let's talk about it now. The form of external annotation. All right. And what I'll be teaching to you now is a variation on a system that in large measure was studied and defined at uh, Columbia University 
and then in any number of other universities as well. And then kind of uh, uh, the, the system that I'll be teaching to you is one that we just work with in research to try and find what's the best way. I mean, it's simple, right? You go onto a campus. Let's just say the University of Wyoming. You walk onto the engineering school and you say, give us your top five students in all four grades, in all four classifications. And then you just sit down with them and you say, how do you study? Like, I want to see how you take notes. Well, over time, guess what? They, it all starts to look the same. You start to get an idea. Ah, oh, they're really top students. They kind of get a sense. All right, here we go. Blank sheet of paper, as referenced by, you know, the fact that it's three-hole punched, okay? The first suggestion I'm going to make is you draw a line right down the center of the page, okay? You're going to put a line down the center of the page, and the reason is so that you can get ready for the annotative process. The annotative process will have three parts. A, what you do before you come to class. B, what you do while you're in class. C, what you do after class in the, in the form of exam prep. Remember, you're, right, you're reading so you can respond, okay? What you're going to do before class is going to be done in red ink. This is what we call pre-class annotations, okay? The reason why I recommend you do it in red ink is because you've already got red ink in your hand while you are doing in text annotations, internal annotations, right? So you're reading the biology uh, chapter three on photosynthesis, right? Sounds exciting, doesn't it? And uh, while you're reading, you've got a red ink pen in your hand and you're taking notes in the text, but you're also taking notes off the text. Now the first thing I always recommend is to make sure that you log in correctly. This login is important because good students are organized students, that's huge. So while you're taking notes off the page in note paper, you want to make sure that you've got the appropriate information logged in. For example, and most importantly, page number information. So if it's chapter three of the biology text, you definitely want to correlate that up here, right? So that you know it's chapter three. And then you're obviously going to keep, you know, that's why we're going with a three ring notebook approach. You're going to keep these pages in order, okay? Maybe the date it's due, the date the prof gave the lecture, et cetera, et cetera. Or when you did it, however you want to do that. That's this login information, okay? Then, here, you're simply going to take notes from the text using the guideline that I had written right here, right? Those three parts. So, for example, just think of it as intro, treatments, review. Okay? You're going to put that information right here. Now, the way you do that will vary depending upon the discipline. So, for example, if you studied with an English person, a literature person, there might be some guiding questions that were taught to you. What does the text say? What does the text mean? How does the text relate? I'll actually go through that at the end of this semester because I'm trying to get you ready for the 1020 class where you got to take a lit class, okay? And then you got to read stories, poems, wretchedness like that. And so then you've got to come up with a way to take notes over that stuff. It will depend on the discipline. The key here is you're going to take information from the text. You're going to put it in your own words. The suggestion is keep it short, bullet point everything. Okay? Try and put it in your own words. So don't copy huge chunks out of the book. Okay? All right? And to some degree, I, that was kind of my reference to you, Ms. Vega, in my comments. You don't feel like you've got to write everything because there's a combination of, uh, uh, happening here where you're taking in, in internal annotation as well as external. Now, to be fair, because I loaned you these books, you're not doing internal annotations on those books, right? Okay, so all of your annotative work that I care about, see, is going to come in the form of some kind of some kind of note-taking, like this. Now, some students don't like the line down the center of the page. It's a distraction to them, and they don't like having to write so little. So they like to go this way across the page. And they'll put their pre-class notes up at the top with their in-class notes down below. I recommend this uh, because I know it works, all right? And here's why it works. In-class annotations, okay? I mean, if you've ever sat in a class, soon you will where the prof just shows up and starts lecturing, doesn't stop talking for the entire hour, hour and a half lecture. Just talks, 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 right? The obvious question is, dude, what do you write down in class? Because you can't write everything down. The prof's talking too fast. Maybe the biology prof talking on photosynthesis chapter three. When I first got into this business, I talked to students who had been valedictorians and solidatorians out of their high school, and they were dropping out of the university where I was. They were leaving in their freshman year. We were interviewing them. Dude, why are you leaving? This place sucks. I hate it. Social? No. Academic.